Oh, now it's showing me that we're live. So yeah. now it's working on my end. Hopefully it won't kick us off. Oh, that's again. so interesting. I guess the old version works, but the new version doesn't or something. Anyway, round two of <laughs> trying to be live. Hopefully um, only round two this time, because yeah. last week we had to do like six times. <laughs> we can't keep doing it if it's not going to work. Figure out a different option. Okay. Facebook so, and Zoom, we are requesting you solve yeah. this problem. <laughs> help us. Please help us. Um, we can overcome technology during this time of crisis. Though. Totally. <laughs> anyway, so what we were talking about in our video before in our first part was like how, like a lot of times what we're seeing now is either total alarm, everything's terrible or like kind of what often feels like a fake positivity pressure to be positive, at least like pressure to encounter this in a positive way. And like, that's not to say positive feelings don't feel good, but when we're resisting negative feelings that come up, it really can turn into way more crisis, I think way more alarm because our brains are like, that's not true. That's not true. That positive thing isn't true. Let me show you all of the alarm you need to have and just reinforces it. So I always look to alternatives that are not positive, that not like so positive that they feel unbelievable, that feel more neutral than the alarm we're experiencing so that you don't have to avoid the news. You don't have to avoid the alerts coming up. You don't have to avoid the alarm that your brain wants to offer you, but you can also transition out of it if you want to. Um, so we want to talk about a couple of specific, do you want to lead into the specifics that we're going to talk yeah, about? Yeah, sure. So you talked about last week on a Facebook live and also went out up on our blog and out to our email list. Um, just kind of the uh, resources and tools that are available to people. So one of the things that has come up in the news recently is um, one of the only things they've passed so far is the new sick leave law. But there have been a bunch of articles on that about how its scope is too narrow because it apparently covers people in the range of like, or employers in the range of like 50 employees to 500 employees. Right. And the articles that I've seen were saying that most small businesses have less than 50 and most employers who have tons of employees who would be affected have more than 500. So that and that's the federal law. So Oregon state right. has a sick leave law that's separate than the federal law that's more than uh, employer if impacts employers with more than 10 employees. So it does okay. impact everyone, but it is less robust in what it requires. Um, so, I mean, I think the reality is that a lot of employees are asking their employers to lay them off instead of restricting their hours or relying on sick leave. But then you do have people who are sick Right. And so need benefits, need like health insurance benefits. And if you get laid off, there's some issue of whether that transitions you out of health insurance benefits. But I think that this law does also have some requirements about health insurance benefits being in place. And so there's some, uh, and I think that there have been a couple other things at least proposed that would continue health insurance benefits for. Yeah. Yeah. I know a bunch of the stuff that they're working on addresses more of that kind of nitty gritty yeah. stuff. So, I mean, the reality that uh, we were looking at the, it was a Washington post, I think article yeah. that we can link to, but it was talking about how frontline workers who are providing childcare, who are like, uh, medical assistants who are gas station attendants who are working in grocery stores are so likely to get impacted by the virus and really the protections that we've set up for these very vulnerable people are not enough to really get them through this crisis safely and so then I think the the thing that happens is if you're a person who works at a grocery store, if you're a um, 
person who does childcare for a living. I've, I've even had some service providers who I typically use reach out to me and say, I'm really worried about my business, but I can't safely keep providing this service or keep offering this service. I can't guarantee that it won't spread the virus. And I think that a lot of people are um, like see this and then feel totally defeated and helpless and hopeless. And even some of us who are not in those industries feel so worried about the people who are in those industries, but helpless to do. I mean, okay. So this is real. We got to pause and talk about that for a minute because I'm an Enneagram two and always like empathetic to a fault. So this is a place where I've had to really be careful about like who I'm interacting with and the things that I'm taking on like during this, because I can feel all the feel like I can feel all the people's feelings and like put myself in like everyone's shoes. So at some point I have to be like, okay, like, you know, like that is where like I can be engaged, but then also realize like, I can't take on like my friend's friends, like situation that she's got going on, you know? And well, and even then really, it still comes back to our thoughts, create our feelings, other people's thoughts, create their feelings. And so what we're really doing is we're playing out this story of somebody else's disaster, but then we're the ones that are living with that. And the reality of that is when we're playing out the, and I'm not saying ignore other people's problems or don't be compassionate but compassion is very different than creating a disaster for ourselves in our minds, because what ends up happening is then we disconnect. We're not even willing to hear other people's stories because our brains are creating so much internal trauma related to their stories, right? We think I can't be on Facebook anymore. I can't watch the news anymore because I am playing out these disaster stories in my mind and then feeling defeated and hopeless and terrible, right? And so I think like the solution is not disconnecting. The solution is not uh, bootstrap, like expecting people to bootstrap or being like, oh, they should just get through it. They'll get through it fine and everything will be okay. Like not fake positivity. But I think if we can really pause in that moment and really let ourselves feel however we're feeling, not blaming it on somebody else and saying, okay, their health insurance is creating my hopelessness, right? But then really being like, I do feel hopeless right now. Like I am strong enough to feel the feeling of hopelessness. I'm strong enough to uh, like have this feeling come up. And then what I do when I have that happen is I like, like a lot of times we don't want to feel negative feelings because we think that if we, if we let those feelings happen, then we'll get stuck in them for forever. But really what happens is when we (laughs) resist those feelings, when we don't let them process, then we get stuck in them because we're like negotiating with them. And really feelings are just a release of chemicals from our brain into our body, right? Like there's nothing wrong and it does like chemically process, but then our response to it makes a difference in how that processes. So what I do is I say, okay, I'm feeling hopeless. How does it feel? And I get curious about the actual physical sensation of the emotion that's happening for me, let myself have it. And then it does pass, like notice that it does pass, but actually like be present with myself and let the feeling happen and know that there's not like, like feelings are basically the worst thing that can happen to us. And also most of them are not as painful as a paper cut. So like they're okay to have. And then like, like, cause I think that what we try to do then is we try to fix the feeling by trying to make other people change their feelings first. And it just is like the longest way around to changing the feelings. So I think that now is an opportunity to really like develop a practice of letting all of the feelings happen mm-hmm. and not have it be terrible and then not getting, not indulging in them, not getting stuck in them. Because I think when we do get stuck in hopelessness, when we do like indulge in hopelessness, a lot of times we're in that place where we're like, I have to avoid Facebook. I have to avoid the news. I can't hear my friend. I can't talk to my friends anymore because I'm feeling so hopeless. 
Totally. And I think like I, so one of my happy places where I am staying engaged, but also remaining light about it is Trevor Noah has been doing the daily social distancing show from his couch, which has been the best ever, but he was interviewed about that the other day. And he was like, listen, I, you know, like everybody has like such big feelings and there's so much going on right now, but just a quick reminder that like, we can like have all the feelings in this moment, but also remember that like the world isn't ending. Like it can seem like it if you're out and the streets are like completely empty, like it's weird. Right. But like, we're going to come through this, like the world isn't ending, like on the other side of it, there's still going to be like stuff going on, but like, you know, like keep that like perspective of like, and and the world doesn't even stop. Right. Cause then I think if we're feeling hopeless, if we're feeling defeated, like what we can do is say, how do I want to feel? What is the impact I do want to make? How do I need to feel in order to make that impact? And usually the feeling because all of our actions come from our emotions. So if we want to make an impact, we don't need to feel like joy, excited, delighted, content, peace. We need to feel motivated and courage, right? And those don't feel as good as joy, excited, like peace, content, right? But like, if we want to shift from hopelessness and defeated to motivated, I think there's like a lot of available perspective and thoughts that can make us motivated to make an impact and, and to continue our lives right now. What is the next step in our lives right now that keeps them going? That doesn't pause them. That doesn't say, because there's a pandemic, I need to not make an impact anymore or just give up and Totally. Yeah. I feel like, okay, so this was going to be our, and we usually try and end on like a happy, positive, something that's going on in the world. But I feel like that was the perfect segue into this. So I'm actually going to bring this up now and yeah. but, um, so many people in the world are like being motivated to do work based on what is going on right now and like shifting what they're doing and shifting perspectives. So like, we just read an article about how Christian Diano and the founder of American Apparel have like completely, like they shut down fashion production, but then realized like, oh my goodness, we could actually be like making um, medical equipment yeah. supplies materials like to help the hospitals right now so they've shifted into like making masks and gowns and like all the things that the hospitals need and like um locally marley's monsters is like doing so many fabric masks i think they're doing them like for more than just like our community for sure but like they're doing fabric masks that aren't like they're not as protective, like they wouldn't qualify necessarily as PPE, but they go over the N95s to hopefully prolong the life and the usefulness of them because there is such a shortage. So, so helpful. And like people in communities, like all across everywhere are like, you know, sewing and doing what they can, like getting so creative, like there has been a shortage of elastic. So people are like cutting like hair bands in half and like just yeah. doing what they can to help. And then like, I read that, um, GM retrofitted their manufacturing, stopped like manufacturing cars, retrofitted their manufacturing to try and like create ventilators for hospitals. And um, scientists in Italy like figured out how to turn scuba gear into ventilators. And like doctors, I think in California figured out how to turn one ventilator into, I think they said like nine. Um, So people are just like taking the skills that they have, exactly moving that. Like I feel so hopeless and defeated but like motivated to do something to help and change and like coming up with all these like crazy great things that actually are super useful and helpful right now. And it doesn't force you to be like, don't feel hopeless. Don't feel defeat. It just transitions it to something that is also potentially available in, in what we're doing. Like when I have a lot of my clients will come to us and they'll say, I'm just so overwhelmed and confused. I don't know what to do next. I um, don't have enough money. I don't have enough this or that. There's not enough. And um, I'm so overwhelmed with not being able to do anything. I don't know what to do. And the thing that I always notice is the thought, I don't know what to do is always a choice. 
And if you just ask yourself, what if I did know what to do? What I have my clients do is just be curious. What if I did know what to do? What would my guess be? And I'm not judging any of the options. And then make a list of a hundred things that you can do. I Sometimes I let them start with 25. But the thing I notice is they can, within like 15 minutes, I have never had somebody not be able to make a list of 25 ways that they can get money, things that they can do to contribute. Uh, like if you just ask your brain, what if I did know what to do, then that can pull you out of the overwhelmed confusion place that I think a lot of people feel like they're in right now. And then that's how you get to the point of like, oh, I have a bunch of fabric and I can make totally masks. Yeah. Like, what if I could just make masks? What is the need right now? What do people need right, right now? I think that there's more need than almost any time that we've been here on earth. <laughs> right? I agree. And I think that is something like, that is why it's worth like feeling your feelings and asking these questions now. Right. Because that is something that is not going to go away anytime soon. Yeah. Like we are going to get through this. We are going to come out of it, but even on the other side, there's still going to be like an, an incredible amount of need in ways that we haven't seen before, like in our lifetimes. So yeah. 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 So I think that like they're sort of showing us it's always possible to transition what you're doing to meet that need to be available to contribute and make an impact. I think that for all of us is possible. And I see a lot of people sort of believe that they have to stay in overwhelm or they have to stay in confusion because of their socioeconomic status, because of their family, because of all these reasons. And I just always suggest that it's possible to transition to motivated, to courage, to something that is going to help you take some kind of action. Yeah. 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 That's good. Yeah. Um, Oh, wait. So another thing that is being done, I know, is a lot of um, domestic violence hotlines and resources are kind of ramping up what they yeah. can on like the virtual <laughs> side of things. As as Sorry. Hi, Emma. <laughs> Working from home. Yeah. <laughs> All the time anyway. <laughs> um, yeah. So I think for, de, for people who have experienced partner violence or are experiencing partner violence or intimidation, coercion, any kind of abuse in the home, now is kind of a time to seriously think about getting help and asking for help. Like, I think that that's the other thing to be aware of, be like conscious of is sometimes motive sometimes the feeling of motivated or courage is about asking for help and getting help not giving help right like mm -hmm. just being willing to consider that it's possible to reach out and get help and that being at home or being um being in like shelter in place or social distancing does not prevent us from asking for help and so uh you were gonna give so in 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 Lane I, County, we have women's space. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say it, in Lane County, we have women's space. I've got their number and um, nationally, we have the National Domestic uh, yeah, Violence so Hotline. Give those yeah, me. I'll say them right now and then we'll also put them in the comments when we're done. So uh, women's space is 541-485-8232. And the National Domestic Violence Hotline nationally is 800-799-7233. And then there's a website, domesticshelters.org, that if you're not in Lane County, that list, that has connections and contact information for all of the national uh, shelters for people. And the shelters... Some of the shelters, my understanding is they're staying open and taking precautions, but all, but the hotlines are, have been staffed and they're like, just calling is a first step. Just, um, considering that you can call the other advice that I always give people is if you are in danger, law enforcement is still working. Uh, mm -hmm. we have a client who is in a situation 
at home that she believes may not be safe. And I talked to her last Thursday and I was supposed to hear from her on Friday and did not. And so I called the sheriff's non-emergency line to ask them to do a welfare check for her. And they said that they would likely be able to send somebody out to do a welfare check or they would at least be in touch with me. And so law enforcement can do welfare checks. If you're in a situation that's dangerous, uh, a lot of people who are experiencing violence believe that they can't call 911 because their partner will break their phone or will retaliate against them. You can call 911 and pretend to be ordering pizza and they will come to your house. You don't have to call 911 and give the report. They know that sometimes people can't do that. So if you're in danger, you can call 911 and pretend to order pizza, give the details of where you are, answer yes or no questions for them, and they will send somebody out. That's not considered a prank call. That's considered a serious call. Um, and so, yeah. That's great. That is like super helpful, useful advice, I would think right now, especially with um, shelter in place, because you're often isolated from the rest of your folks and like don't have autonomy anymore in your home because all your people are there. So that is really good advice. I think that when we're stuck in a place of thinking, I don't know what to do, or um, there's too much to do, or um, things are hopeless, there's always like that shift to be able to just ask, what if there was one thing I could do? What if, what if I could imagine I knew what I could do? It can get you to that one next step you need to take to be safer to be um, healthier while we are sort of while we're shelter in place. Right. And check in on your friends. I think that like goes without saying, because a lot of times we don't even know who might be in a situation like that. So don't like check in on them with the intention of being like, oh, I think you're in an unsafe space, but check in on them just with the intention of like checking in on people. And I think, so I tried to contact our client who I had the concerns about a number of times. And um, I ultimately thought, why not ask the police to do a, a welfare check? Like, I think that if you really are concerned about people, a lot of times we minimize yeah. our concern and we're not willing to access resources for other people, but they're available um, if you have somebody that you're concerned about, you can also call the shelter line, the, the partner violence hotlines and ask questions about how you can help. Um, and they'll help you with that. That's good. Yeah, that's good. Okay. So moving on, I think one yeah. of the last things we have to talk about is, um, Weinstein tested positive for COVID. Um, which kind of leads into this like broader discussion then of like social distancing in prisons and the situation that we have in prisons right now. And then also like how this time is really highlighting so many of the like institutional problems that we have in America right now yeah. from like healthcare to yeah. law enforcement yeah. in prison to education and national leadership. It kind of like runs the gamut. It is really interesting that it took this like one thing to kind of like expose all of our like weaknesses sort of. Yeah, I've been saying like, I, it seems like the earth is like, y'all are on a timeout until you figure out. A hundred percent, right? Like, <laughs> let's just, you don't want to deal with any of them ever. Let's just do it all at once. Yeah, like, you've been making a lot of excuses for a long <laughs> time and I don't want to hear it anymore. Go to your rooms, figure it out. Totally. Yeah. Totally. yeah. And so with Weinstein, he is a very high risk patient because he already has a heart condition and he's in the age range of yeah. being um, at risk. I saw that uh, Prince Charles also got diagnosed with. Man. Yeah. I had heard someone in the royal family had it, but they weren't announcing for a long time who it was. Mm -hmm. so. They're isolating yeah. Camilla and Charles are isolating in Scotland, I guess. I saw this alert. So, I mean, I think that with Weinstein, there's that um, karmic question, but then also the thing that it raised is 
that I guess Rikers Island uh, prison is now they have 38 confirmed cases and not enough medical supplies and they're still shipping prisoners into Rikers Island and out of, which is gonna create a ton of cross-contamination. Totally, and so the article on that was saying that there was a man who I think was a low, lower risk, like his crime wasn't as severe, lower mm -hmm. risk inmate, but he was has asthma and there's yeah. all these cases there and it's spreading like wildfire and they're transferring him in anyways, which some of the people in the article were like, okay, like we got to stop and like check our humanity for a second. Like, yeah. how do we feel about that? Because you're essentially like, it's like death penalty guaranteeing that yeah. he is going to get it and probably like not survive. So, and then like it calls into, so the eighth amendment constitutionally protects prisoners from cruel and unusual punishment. Mm -hmm. And like, it really calls into question is transferring prisoners to a known outbreak place cruel and unusual. I think likely there will be lawsuits around yeah. cruel and unusual punishment with this. And then because it's a state of emergency, there may be exceptions for it, which is really troubling. And then the other place that this is like hugely concerning is the ICE detention centers where people have not committed crimes and they have, um, potentially they shouldn't even be held, right? There are other even without the outbreak, but people are still being held um, in these really unsafe, unhealthy conditions just because they crossed the border. And so the ACLU filed a lawsuit uh, asking for immediate release of those prisoners. And I think there's a lot of concern, like there are a number of groups um, who are working to help people detained by ICE but it calls into question the whole systemic, who do we imprison? The and why, and like, why? you yeah. know, I mean, a bunch of people that I've seen are like mm. freaking out completely livid that they're releasing people, but it's like half of these people have like minor drug offenses, you know, right. like- If they are in, if they're, if they're in prison <laughs> for having a, some, like amount of marijuana that is actually legal in most states. And then they contract coronavirus because like, do we think that that is the fair punishment because they're just being held or transferred to a, an unsafe place? I think again, people are like automatically going to this fear place of like, oh my gosh, they're letting the prisoners out. Like, you know, they're letting like the worst of the worst out which is not the situation, but in some way, shape or form, like just like, with education, our teachers are so taxed, just like with healthcare, our system is so taxed. Same thing with prisons, like so many of them are so taxed. They have like not enough personnel, so much overcrowding that like something like this happens and we can't like maintain like status quo because it's just not possible. And, and it's not the right, it's not like the, like we talk about the punishment fitting the crime. Right, yeah, it's like not. Yeah the punishment that fits the crime. But then I think that that can contribute to that alarm that we talked about. Like, uh, like it's, we, I, I don't know, my brain runs this scene of a zombie apocalypse, like uh, people running the streets, breaking glass and then zombies attack, you know, like my totally. brain runs a full on zombie apocalypse scenario <laughs> when, when it wants to offer me some alarm. And like, we go out on walks every morning and everybody's being very careful on the paths to walk into the grass and stay away from each other. But then on some level, I, I'll be out and there'll be nobody around and I'll think somebody's coming. <laughs> <laughs> this is what my brain shares. It's very, my brain's super helpful when it wants yeah, to Yeah, be. yeah, um, Well, Levi and I watched World War Z yeah. the other night. So, and we were both like the whole time. It was so funny. Like about halfway through the movie, I was like, oh my gosh, my arms hurt so bad. Cause I realized we were both just like this. Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so tense and like gripping. <laughs> I mean, and the truth is we're not having a zombie apocalypse. No, like, that is no. Not happening. People are responding appropriately and taking care of themselves. And we have a lot of neighbors who need help and who need support. And I think that like 
now is just the time when we're with our brains without distraction more than we usually are, right? Like normally we have all these distractions to not think about the prison system, to not think about ICE detention, to not think about healthcare problems, to not think about like problems with our education system. And now we're just with our brains by ourselves, most of us, or with our families, which is like being with other versions of our own brain, <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> and then how do we deal with that, right? How do we treat ourselves with compassion and then still take action to make the impact that we want? We can still call our representatives while we're at home isolating, mm -hmm. right? We can still ask how we can volunteer if we want to volunteer for a cause that we care about while we're at home, while we're isolating. Yeah. So much of the impact that we can make can be, we can still check in on our friends who we think might be at risk while we're at home, while we're isolating, right? There's so many things that we can still do and then still come back to being with ourselves, letting ourselves have that zombie apocalypse movie moment and know that like our brains are really good at saving our lives. Like they offer us this alarm because if we were being chased by a zombie, we would want our brains to be like alert, alert run right and that's all is they're they're just doing what they're programmed to do to say alert something terrible has happened run jump up a tree like climb a tree right now right. and it's just not <laughs> what we need to do it's not the appropriate response right now so then what is like what is going to make the impact that we want to make to really mm -hmm. solve these problems I always have this belief that I was saying this actually to a client. So it's interesting, the environmental impact that the virus has had like of cleaning up the environment. But I always have this belief that there's somebody out there who has the solution to climate change in their brain. And all they need to do is just change their thinking a little bit and feel a little bit motivated, feel a little bit of courage. And they're gonna have the easy solution to climate change and just offer it to us. And it's not gonna be hard work or terrible. Like there's somebody out there who has the solution to prison reform, to ICE detention. And like now is the time for us to like get creative and find the solutions and feel the feelings. Totally, totally. Yeah, and I think even just like on a personal level, like it is so interesting. It's funny that you talk about it like being the earth's way of like giving us a time out you know but I feel like I feel like that even in our personal lives because for me I know that for like the last like two or three years at least I've been like oh my gosh I'm so exhausted like I'm so like so busy like we're so busy all the time we have all of these things going on you know and like even though it was crazy like how quickly it happened and like getting used to this new rhythm and this like new way of doing life. Like one thing I'm not sad about at all is all of the things that got dropped off my plate, like instantaneously. And then realizing like the things that I actually like care about and like are super important to me, like are the ones that I'm like really missing, which is not very many by the way. And like everything else is which just- Which is so like, interesting because you always could have chosen that, right? A hundred percent, but I was never going to, you know what I mean? Ah. Like, I mean, I was getting better at it being like, I can't sustain this pace. Like, this is crazy. Like this is not working for me. And I was getting better at it, but like, this really has been like, okay, like this is where my heart is. Like, this is what's important. Like, these are the things that I like clearly care about because these are the ones that I'm really missing right now and everything else. I just feel like, oh, thank goodness that I don't have to do that thing. And you then know? how do you let yourself have those things now, I think is the other key. Mm -hmm. Like, how do we get creative enough yeah. to let ourselves still have those things that are our passions, that are what we want? And the thing I always think about is like, us, Beyonce, like uh, Prince Charles, like, uh, I don't know, all of us are doing one thing at a time. Mm -hmm. And is the thing we're doing sitting and feeling overwhelmed and confused? Or is the thing that we're doing one thing to take action, right? Like there's always the opportunity to just do one thing. And I think we get so focused on that big, like, 
picture of the problem, right? The big picture of the prison problem, the big picture of the ICE detention problem, all of it. And when we're stuck there, we're usually just sitting in overwhelm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then if we can just ask like, what's one thing I can do? There's always something that feels better and that feels productive and like, um, even just giving ourselves permission to think me watching World War Z with my husband is the best thing right now. This is the impact that I want to make me taking the puppy for a walk. This is how I restore my energy and how I make sure I can contribute. It is productive. Just having that belief that the next thing that we're doing, whether it's resting or, or mm -hmm. refilling or taking action is productive. It is making an impact. Like I think that frees us up to make the impact that we want to make. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. That's good. Well, I think we hit all of our topics, yeah. that's it. but as always, if people are watching and they have questions or things that they would like us to discuss, um, come yeah. up, definitely let us know. We're happy to talk about whatever you guys want to know yeah. about what's on your mind right now. And if you want to stay in the know about um, career defense, healthy workplace culture, like the things that are available to you during this time to create safe space for your employees or like what you can do as an employer or on the flip side as an employee, like what your rights are and resources and tools that are available to you. Um, you can drop your email in the comments and we will add you to our list. We only send things or out once a week. So even if you're not comfortable putting contact information in the comments, just send us a private message with your information. Um, or like reach out however you're comfortable. I think yeah. Yep. I'll put our info in the comments as well. So yeah. yeah. Sounds good. All right. Thank Good chatting you. with you. You too. I'm going to